I'm Chris Bryant, CCIE number 12933, and welcome to the second part of our three-part look at floating static routes. In the first in the series, we discussed the theory of a floating static route, and what we're going to do now is take a look on live Cisco routers, a scenario that really mirrors one that I've seen more than once in my career, where you have a path that, for whatever reason, whether you don't want the overhead on the path, maybe it's not the most reliable, or maybe the client just doesn't want you touching it, uh, we can't run a routing protocol on it. So in the network we're going to build here, we've got our usual frame relay cloud, and that network is 172.12.123.0 slash 24. So I've left that out for clarity's sake, because I know we've got a lot going on here. We've got an Ethernet segment, 172.12.23.0 slash 27 between our routers 2 and 3 and then finally between routers 1 and 3 a separate link over the 210.110 slash 24 network and note that RIP version 2 is only running on the serial 0 interfaces that are in the frame relay cloud and over the Ethernet segment. It's not running over the 210.110 network and also again for whatever reason, good or bad, we can't run a routing protocol over that particular link. But we want to use this link as a backup to get to that Ethernet segment if the frame goes down. So let's see if we can meet those requirements with a static route. And we'll start here on router 1. I've already checked those connections, so we're good to go as far as uh, the IP connectivity. And we'll go ahead and configure RIP on here. And we're going to hard code it for version 2 and disable the auto summarization feature. And that command will enable RIP on the frame relay segment and then on routers 2 and 3 also on the Ethernet segment. do it and then we'll go over to router 3 exact same command so we'll see if router 1 has a couple of rip routes by now and it does just as a quick reminder this of course is the full routing table with the code table as well show IP route if you only want to look at commands that are derived from a specific source, say if you only want to look at your RIP routes or your EIGRP routes or even just your static or connected, you can run show IP route with that source listed right after it. So with show IP route RIP, we can see that we have two routes to the 172.12.23.0 slash 27 network. Now let's bring the diagram back up and we'll see where that came from. We are running RIP over this link or over this entire network and over the Ethernet segment. So router 1 is getting an advertisement from router 2 and router 3 about this 172.12.23 network. And since the hop count, the metric for RIP, is exactly the same, and that's 1, the second number in the brackets is always the metric of the path, then RIP by default will perform equal cost load balancing. So we're seeing what we expect to see here so far. But now going back to the diagram, we want to bring in the 210.110 link, but we only want to use it as a backup. But we can't run a routing protocol over it, and if we can't use dynamic routing, that does kind of narrow it down to static routing. So that's what we'll do now and configure a static route. We do that with the IP route command, and we'll put in for the destination prefix 172.12.23.0. The destination prefix mask will have 255, 255, 255, 224. Your next option is always, or options are, I should say, your next hop IP address or your local router's exit interface. I like to use the next hop IP address to each their own there, certainly. And of course, in uh, Cisco exam prep, always a good way to know more than one way to do things. And that IP address is router 3's S1 address on this link, 210.113. And that's it. So what is the result of that now? What's going to happen? Let's take a look at our routing table and find out. And 
then we see actually what we don't want to see is an end result. The static route is in the table, but the rip routes are gone. And we didn't do anything to stop those rip routes, right? We didn't take anything down. Let me run show IP route rip under that. And they're not in the routing table. The static route is in the routing table because of its lower administrative distance. You can see that we created the static route to the exact same route that RIP was letting us know about a few minutes ago. 172.12.23.0.27. So therefore, Router 1 is still getting those advertisements from Routers 2 and 3 for that network, and now it also has a static route. So it's going to use some kind of tiebreaker to decide which kind of route to put in that routing table because the network prefix is exactly the same and the mask length is exactly the same. So the tiebreaker is administrative distance and that is always going to be the first number inside those brackets. So you'll always see administrative distance slash metric for the path. The lowest administrative distance or the lower the administrative distance the more believable the source of the route. If RIP has an AD of 120, which it does, that is a lot higher than a static route AD of 1, and therefore the static route is considered more trustworthy and it's going to be put into the routing table. But that's a problem for us in this scenario because we only want to use this link to get to that Ethernet segment if the entire frame goes down, if say R1's S0 interface goes down. So that's where a floating static route comes in. What we'll do is take this a static route off that we just wrote and then we'll put on a floating static route and test that in part three of this series and that's coming up right after part two actually if you're waiting for these and just as a reminder over 300 Cisco and Microsoft tutorials out at the main website the, the bryantadvantage.com slash tutorials.htm we've also got a new Network Plus 2009 certification site networkpluscertification.com and I'm also pleased to announce that our famous CCNA Mastermind webinar is going on demand uh, rather than absolutely live because we've had literally thousands of students around the world who wanted to take it, but they were hemmed in by the time zone differences. It's just like being at my 25 plus hour CCNA Mastermind webinar, and now you get to watch the sessions on your schedule when you're ready. Plenty of information and details on that still to come. You can also find that at the website thebryantadvantage.com. Thanks for taking a few minutes to watch this video and I look forward to showing you part three. I'm Chris Bryant CCIE number 12933 and I'll see you on the website.